Welcome, everybody, to our session on the role of international financial centers in attracting international capital in cooperation with the Astana International Financial Center and the World Alliance of International Financial Centers. My name is Jochen Biedermann, and I will guide you through our session. Let me start uh, diving into this very crucial topics for our economies by introducing Jennifer Reynolds. Jennifer is not only the chair of the World Alliance of International Financial Centers, but also the president and CEO of Toronto Finance International. Jennifer, the floor is yours. Thank you, Jochen. Well, welcome to everyone today. Thank you for joining. Um, as Jochen mentioned, I, I'm the uh, chair of the World Association of International Financial Centers. And, and this organization is, is very unique in that it brings together uh, financial centers from around the world uh, to focus on issues which we're all facing, on the opportunities and the challenges that we face as financial centers and, and countries, mm -hmm. and to focus on sharing best practices and increasing collaboration uh, between our financial centers and financial markets. And so the discussion today obviously is very topical. How do we attract capital uh, as financial centers? What is our role? Uh, clearly, it is absolutely critical. I know that I work in Toronto with many of my different uh, counterparts uh, domestically to attract capital to our markets. It is no doubt just it is a part of many other countries economic strategies, ours in Canada, is to attract uh, capital from other jurisdictions to, to invest in, in the resources of our country and the development of our country. And so I think this will be a very topical discussion for so many on the line today. It really takes a, a huge community to attract that capital. It's organizations like Toronto Finance International, but we work with so many of our counterparts uh, domestically. We're working with government, we're working with private sector, we're working with our stock exchanges, with our economic development partners um, in our country, and, and then fostering uh, different uh, partnerships around the world to attract that capital. So we're gonna have a great discussion today uh, about that. Certainly, you know, we'll, we'll also talk about the importance for emerging economies at attracting uh, foreign direct investment to their economies. I think in, in Toronto, probably the best example of that would be our stock exchange actually has a, a large uh, number of international listings. And, and uh, we really work to attract those listings. It, it's a way for those, those countries to access capital uh, within our market and then across to, uh, to the U.S. So it creates an enormous opportunity for countries to go out of their own jurisdiction, list on another exchange, uh, and access a broader array of capital. So I'm sure we're going to get into to all of these topics. I think that the other thing that I would touch upon before I turn it back to Jochen is one thing we certainly can't ignore right now is the importance of, um, of, of ESG, of, 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 of the different sort of uh, environment, social, governance issues that we all need to think about when we're raising capital. Because investors are looking uh, to make sure that their dollars are going towards uh, countries to companies who care about these issues. And, and I think we certainly all realize in the World Association of International Financial Centers that this is a top priority for, for countries, for investors, and we all need to be thinking about this. And, and so if you're attracting or trying to attract uh, foreign capital, you're certainly going to need to be thinking about how you're uh, treating those issues, how you're reacting to those issues. And so we talk a lot about that uh, amongst uh, our partners. Uh, it certainly is of, of high importance within uh, Canada right now, our focus on that and, and really around the world. And as we emerge from the pandemic, I think clearly we've faced a global crisis with the pandemic and hopefully we're, we're moving through that now, but I think you know climate is our next crisis that we'll all face together. So we, we've learned to work together uh, through this pandemic. Uh, I think hopefully it's taught us how to work together through dealing with the climate crisis that we no doubt will face. And so I, I think that uh, these types of discussions are very important. I think the World Association of International Financial Centers will continue to foster these very important discussions uh, in, uh, in our financial centers and, and together with our other partners. So with that, I will turn it back over to Jochen to lead us through the discussion today. But thank you very much, uh, and I'm looking forward to the discussion. Many thanks, Jennifer, for this uh, well-placed introduction uh, to our topic. Um, I'm especially uh, delighted to have uh, diversity in terms of the, the continents, in terms of uh, geography, uh, looking at our esteemed panelists. 
Um, Jennifer, you represent North America, but uh, we also have representatives from Europe, from Asia, from the GCC and from Africa, which yeah, makes me very happy. Let me introduce the panelists in alphabetic order. Um, first, there's Miles Selig. Miles is the CEO of the City UK, which comprises uh, the, the British financial industry. Um, then we have Alan Hassan. Uh, Ana, Ali, uh, Ali Hassan. Ali is a senior representative of Europe and North America of uh, Dubai International Financial Center. Furthermore, you know, locally from Nur Sultan, uh, James Martin, the chief investment officer of Astana International Financial Center. And last but definitely not least, Ntudi Muyelu. Uh, he is the chief investment officer of Rwanda Finance. Let me start uh, maybe with you, Ntudi. Um, for uh, Rwanda's future development path, of course, it's crucial to attract sufficient international capital. So maybe can you elaborate a little bit on what is the role of Rwanda finance in that respect? And what are your experiences in talking to international investors? And in particular, what do they expect from Rwanda? Thank you very much, Joran, for this uh, question. And it is a pleasure to be here on this panel with uh, the other colleagues from uh, international financial centers. Um, so first of all, again, my name is Trudy Muyelo. I'm the Chief Investment Officer of Rwanda Finance Limited. Um, Rwanda Finance Limited is an agency in charge of promoting and developing what is called Kigali International Financial Center um, in Rwanda. So to, to your question, if you allow me, I will not actually directly answer to it on what is the um, need for Rwanda for its future development path, but more look at the continental, the Africa continent. Um, as you have rightly said, uh, here we have representatives from different continents, and we Rwanda Finance, we only represent um, this, I would say, growing continent being Africa, where there is clearly a gap in terms of financial centers, and I will say Pan-African and international financial centers. So for the development of the continent, I want to give maybe just one number for people to realize what you are talking about. Um, today, the African Development Bank um, expects to, to see a need in terms of private equity financing around 100 billion per year on the continent. And we have to remember that uh, Africa was experiencing a growth between four to six percent uh, before COVID, uh, Rwanda being above eight to ten percent. So the need of funding is crucial, not only for Rwanda but for the continent, and it is for us a key to be able to attract those um, new investment coming from the international market. Um, with the current saving that we have on the continent we cannot maintain the growth of our economy. And our role in Rwanda for the region and for the continent is really to develop this innovative, attractive, and competitive ecosystem that will make it easy for investment coming into the continent to find a home, a place to actually uh, expand uh, throughout the continent. So on that respect, what we are doing in Rwanda is first to look at the legal and regulatory framework that we are providing to investors. We want to make sure that when someone is looking for a compliant place to do business, there is the right, uh, the right fit, I will say, with what Rwanda can offer. Same wise, when we look at an investor who is looking for connectivity within Africa, because remember Africa being the continent with uh, the most number of countries, here we're talking about uh, 54 countries, um, it is important to, fly, to find a place where you can easily connect through, um, through DTA, through, through airlines, uh, through all type of partnership with all the countries around. And Rwanda wants to play that, that role. And the third one is, of course, on the level of ease of operation. How is it easy for someone to actually root its investment in Africa through Rwanda? 
So, so clearly our role here is to make this journey into the continent as easy as possible. And what we have experienced with the different international investors is first of all, the need to work on this perception that Africa is sometimes a place difficult to maneuver in. Um, once this perception has been addressed, we see a lot of interest for people to invest more into the continent. And we are happy in Rwanda to see the first investors choosing Kigali International Financial Center for their cross-border investment on the continent. So clearly what, they, what they're expecting from us is to be their partner in the long term, to be a place where they can have access to expertise, to African expertise, a place where they can have access to projects also from the continent, because we have this unique role in Rwanda to consolidate the different types of investment opportunities that someone will look for in Africa. You don't need to go in all the 54 countries to find them. In Rwanda, we are creating uh, a kind of marketplace for strategic investment on the continent. Um, so with, with our value proposition, again, being around compliance, being around connectivity with the rest of Africa and ease of operation, um, working with other African uh, financial centers, we really want to be this new alternative center for business and investment into the continent. So again, thank you, Horn, for the question. And, and I hope uh, it will create more interest from the audience to, uh, to, to come to us. Thank you. I have to congratulate you. Uh, you know, you have really an excellent start. Uh, numbers are great. And uh, in categories like ease of doing business, uh, you're doing very well. Um, that said, uh, of course, uh, maybe uh, some best practice uh, from other financial centers is also of interest for you. Uh, I'm sure you, you're also willing to, to learn from the experience of others. Uh, what has happened in Nur Sultan over the last years at Astana International Financial Center is probably of interest, but also uh, what's what has happened in Dubai over the last 20 years. And in that sense, let me turn to Ali. Uh, Ali, uh, Dubai, of course, has a long hi history of attracting international capital. We have seen uh, lots of landmark projects in, in Dubai. And uh, looking at uh, DFC, uh, when DFC was, was planned and then founded in, in 2002, uh, the ambition was even to become more attractive by offering a financial free zone with a separate legal system. Um, 20 years later now, uh, DFC is among the leading financial centers worldwide and uh, also Dubai as an Emirate is highly successful. So what have you done right and what are the be best practices you can share with others like Ntudi? Yes, certainly uh, Jochen, uh, thank you very much for the question and um, hello everyone, I'm delighted to be here. Uh, I won't mention the football from the other night, uh, Jochen, of course. <laughs> uh, but uh, no, listen, I mean, just by way of background, I've been involved uh, with the DIFC for 16 of its 17 year history. So actually it was live in 2004, that's when the laws were, were in, enacted, whereas the planning started in 2002. I was eight years in Dubai uh, with the regulator there, the financial regulator, the DFSA. And the last eight years, I've been leading international coverage on the business development side, uh, enabling firms to export their expertise, um, products and solutions to, to, to the Miasa, uh, Middle East, Africa, South Asia region. Um, so, you know, and, and before that, I was actually at the, the FSA, as was in the UK, uh, and, um, and uh, business development roles with, with people like Bloomberg. So 30 years experience in financial services. Um, you know, I think, you know, Dubai has been uh, very successful in aggregating capital and talent. And I, I'd like to focus on sort of three reasons or three themes uh, that have uh, enabled that. I mean, if you... You know, firstly, the economic rationale or the market opportunity, right? So if you look at financial centers across the globe, um, you can see a mixture of global international hubs 
uh, coupled with smaller domestic focused locations. Um, you tend to find that financial centers arise as natural clusters of capital, expertise, uh, and, and um, talent uh, around economic activity. So you've got to have that economic activity, I think. Um, so one of the key things that Dubai and DIFC has done really well and really successfully is position itself as a hub uh, for the GCC in the first instance. And the GCC uh, is um, uh, you know, a, a region that is uh, diversifying rapidly. Um, the hydrocarbon uh, boom has certainly built up significant asset pools, which are attractive, but now the economies are diversifying and that's generating you know, that economic activity. And secondly, um, Dubai lends itself easily to, to being a hub for that wider region, which gives access to growth markets, you know, such as uh, India, for example. So that's the first thing that I think you really need to have a real economic imperative for a financial center to, to, uh, to come about. Uh, secondly, I think, um, you know, government uh, economic strategy is very important, right? So, you know, uh, the DIFC has been in operation now for almost uh, two decades, but, uh, you know, Dubai's economic strategy, which really underpins the success of the center uh, and its attractiveness has been in place for 50 years. Uh, so this is, you know, this is not something that happens overnight. It takes, it takes time. So what, what did the UAE, what did Dubai do? Uh, so in the 70s, Jebel Ali port uh, was created, the deep water port that gave Dubai a crucial role in the trade flows from Asia into the Middle East, into Europe, Africa, and, and, and beyond. And, and now I think there's around $400 billion of, of global trade that passes through Dubai. I think 60% of Chinese exports uh, you know, pass through Dubai. So hand in hand with trade goes finance, right? Um, you know, in the 80s, uh, Emirates Airline was, was created. And uh, you know, that provides that connectivity that business and the economy uh, requires. And then in the 90s, uh, you had you know, further diversification of the economy in various sectors, um, hospitality, uh, you know, tourism, construction, education, healthcare, all of those giving rise to inward investment opportunities, but at the same time, and probably more importantly, creating the hard and soft infrastructure to support businesses and to attract global talent uh, to the city. Um, so I think you know, the long-term wider economic strategy of, of, a, of a country or a, you know, a region or a city um, is, is, is fundamental to its success. And, and that's certainly what we've seen in the DIFC. Then lastly, I think that innovation and the power of international standards, you know, um, I think Rwanda is very much you know, on the right lines in terms of its commitment. You know, and I think that you know, if you are going to attract international regional market participants, the adoptions of uh, international standards of law and regulation you know, is key. Um, so we were the first, the IFC was the first in the region to adopt a common law legal system uh, and put in place a financial regulator, the DFSA, that operates to international norms. So what you're trying to do you know, is provide that familiar and certain environment uh, for businesses so that they can easily and seamlessly bring business models and control frameworks from elsewhere and um, you know, immerse them into the local ecosystem. International linkages, and you know, we're proud members of the, the World Alliance here as well, international linkages are very, very important to give credibility to those local regulations, for example. So the DFSA, has over 100 MOUs with regulators uh, around the world. And you also do that on the legal side as well to ensure that judgments that your jurisdiction makes are enforceable. That also reinforces the credibility uh, of, of what you have. Um, so we were actually a key innovation. And I think it's also critical that financial centers continue to innovate. So we're seeing a, a shift to the digital economy and we are innovating. Um, we have pushed forward on our uh, future of finance strategy, which I can you know, mention a little bit more later on. Uh, but we now already have a tech 
cluster that's six times as large as anything else in the GCC. Uh, and we see that as going to, you know, as a main driver of growth going forward. So I think another essential element is to continually innovate to underline the success and continue your momentum. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ali. To, to pick up your football theme, you, you have started. Uh, thank you for, you know, kicking the ball to me in, 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 in two different issues. Of course, fintech innovation. This is also at the heart of the, the World Alliance and all our 20 members. And uh, also, uh, uh, of course, uh, you have mentioned your cooperation uh, from a regulatory point of view internationally. Um, we have just published a, a new report on international regulatory cooperation. This is something also we highly support as financial centers. So, yeah, thank you for, for these two, uh, two, two balls you, you kicked to me. Um, let me move, let me move on uh, to, to James and uh, yeah, back to, back to Nur Sultan. Uh, I've mentioned already uh, Astana International Financial Center, uh, a relatively new entity officially launched in 2018. And as Ali corrected me uh, regarding DFC uh, 2004, 2002, But of course, we all know it, it takes years of preparations, you know, convincing public uh, politicians, uh, the leaders in the country, and, you know, putting together everything and then have formally having a start. And I remember also long discussions uh, in Nur Sultan before 2018, uh, uh, you know, before, before it started officially uh, and was, was opened by the, the first president. Uh, Uh, of the uh, uh, Kazakh Republic. Um, yeah, James, a lot has happened since uh, 2018. Mm. Let, me, let me directly ask you, what, are, what is the feedback you receive from international investors and what is needed from a Kazakhstan point of view to attract additional capital? Thank you very much, Joachim. And let me, as, as host from the Astana Finance Days, thank you all for joining and for, for moderating the panel, Joachim. I mean, you've all been such Uh, good friends and allies to us here in the uh, Astana International Financial Center. I mean, from us, um, I, I've worked with you, obviously, Jochen, and some of uh, our colleagues in the financial center through our sort of lives through the capital markets so, and the initial core foundation that apply to the, some of these financial centers. And what I would say was, yes, we established ourselves under constitutional law in 2015. So for us, it was around two, two and a half years. But we did have, it was, a, uh, was an innovation and an inspiration from our founding father, uh, Nur Sultan Nazarbayev. And that was based around the fact that we needed much to Ali's point. Uh, we needed to implement these international standards that people can take their business models and familiarities from their home markets into a new market and feel as comfortable as possible. So for us, it's very much about these fundamentals I like to call it a, a de-risking platform. And when we talk about AIFC as a de-risking platform, it's because we're blessed not only in Kazakhstan, but the wider region of having underlying assets, uh, be, them, be they physical, uh, geographical, or human capital. And it's people want to see how they can avail of these, but in a de-risking environment. So for us, very much to Ali's point, it was the foundation, for instance, of the legal de-risking the court, the arbitration center, and they are set up similar, but not the same as, uh, as the IFC, but they are set up in the UK, the English and Welsh law principles, absolutely. But it's also innovating and modifying on top of that. And that is always to ensure to the innovation and electronic age that we are keeping up as much as possible in what the investors need. And that is stability, transparency, finality with regards to financial payments, et cetera. So we're only quite a nascent market, I should say 2018, but we've already had 500 plus cases in the arbitration center. And the key point again mentioned is the fact that these must be enforceable, not only within the state and the Republic of Kazakhstan, but also internationally. And that's the sort of key differentiator that we have, obviously with only British QC recognized judges there as well. So that's one aspect. The next aspect of de-risking, which I think is key for the financial center, 
is to our colleague from Rwanda's point, they do not want to be going to every single country in the region. You want to come to a single point where we feel comfortable, where we have like-minded men, women mentality that's in place for us to understand. So for us, we've been working very much on the need for structure and articulated bankable projects. We must do the work sometimes further than perhaps in some of the other developed markets, but we must establish projects that are real. Investors want to come here, their compliance allow them to come here and their shareholders because we have the law, but what are they going to play with? So it's about bankable projects. The next level of de-risking is then potential for co-investment. So it's financial de-risking by government skin in the game co-investments. Less so guarantees these days, people are looking for commitment. It may not be for financial reasons, but for again, comfort reasons. And that's very much the case where we have government equity and debt, different sort of shapes and models through the Kazakhstan, through our sovereign wealth fund structure. And then I would say it, it's also about the overall setting, not only of the regulated to international standards, but that people feel familiar with the business practices. So they can see like-minded people who are trying to be in, in, innovative and also to think. So, I mean, I think it's, in summary, it's very much about that effect of some cluster effect that to Jennifer's opening remarks, it's also about how we can bring the captains of industry, the sell side, the buy side together and the government in order to have a one single point of, of meeting that we as the financial center can provide to provide access to a different range of services. Thank you very much. Um, Miles, let me, let me turn to you. For an economy as massive as the as a United Kingdom, of course, attracting international capital, uh, from my point of view, seems to be a complex issue involving many players, maybe it's the city of London, Department for International Trade, or even uh, Downing Street number 10, I guess. So what is the role the city UK uh, plays in that, uh, you know, combination of the different actors and what influence do you have on attracting international capital cap as an industry-led body? Well, thanks uh, very much, Jochen. And I uh, just want to say, delighted to be able to be here uh, to join the event uh, and to be part of such a terrific panel. Uh, so the, the role of City UK is, is to be the representative body for UK-based financial and related professional services. So as I think all of the, the, the previous speakers uh, have identified, there's an ecosystem here that's really important. Uh, and I'll come back to that. And I thought it was also interesting. I think both Ali and James talked about the importance of common law. And I think sometimes that that legal underpinning is uh, uh, forgotten as part of attracting uh, investment. But the way that City UK does that is that we uh, work with government, we work with regulators, we work across the industry uh, to ensure that the UK can compete uh, uh, as effectively as possible for capital. Uh, and that's through having uh, uh, competitive policy systems, competitive regulatory systems, uh, uh, and, and also high standard regulatory systems. Uh, I think there is a, a, a misunderstanding in some parts of the media or politics, for instance, that seems to think that low standards attract business. Actually, high standards attract business and high standards keep business. And that allows you the momentum uh, to continue to grow uh, and to build. Um, and that's particularly important because capital is, is enormously mobile. International capital can go anywhere in the world. Uh, and so for me, the other element of this is to, uh, in order to attract that kind of investment, a, a major international financial center has to have a strong and a welcoming business environment but it also needs to be an attractive place to live, to work. Uh, you know, the reason that you look at uh, New York or London uh, as two of the world's leading full service international financial centers is that apart from the fact that you have uh, uh, the full spectrum of financial and related professional services present in strength there, uh, and historically that's been things like banking, asset management, insurance, uh, the market infrastructure, but also the professional services side. So accountancy, management, consultancy, legal services, as we've already touched upon. 
But as you look to the future of international financial centers and the ability to draw capital, there's livability, there's quality of life. You need to be able to attract people to come and work somewhere, to be based there. Uh, there's ensuring that you've uh, uh, got the right visa systems in place, uh, uh, fly in, fly out rules in place. Uh, and also, as I talk about the uh, uh, the quality of life, that's related not just to uh, uh, theatres, schools, universities, museums, galleries, and so on. Um, it's also around uh, the right transportation, both within a city, uh, but also the international connectivity that you'd be looking for uh, 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 with the rest of the world that allows people to fly in and do business meetings and also fly out uh, with ease to uh, other centres where they would want to do business. So um, what, what our members do is they are part of that ecosystem. They're a vital part of that ecosystem. Uh, they uh, ensure that they can provide uh, the best quality services, the best quality advice, the best quality uh, uh, services to, uh, to clients and customers, both in the UK uh, and uh, around the world. Uh, and so the complexity that you uh, alluded to in your uh, uh, question uh, is one of success. Uh, so uh, it is inevitable that when you have uh, an insurance uh, sector the size of the one in the UK, which is the fourth largest insurance market in the world, but the successful banking, highly successful asset management, very successful legal systems, etc. Uh, each of those bodies, because they achieve a critical mass in and of their own right, uh, will have their own uh, uh, representative bodies. They'll have uh, well-functioning uh, 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 advocacy and compliance and regulatory policy teams within their own companies. Uh, but there is a need to bring all of that together uh, under one under one roof. And when we were set up uh, just over a decade ago by two people, uh, at the request of two people, uh, Alistair Darling, who was the Chancellor of the Exchequer at the time uh, in the, uh, the Labour government uh, of Gordon Brown, um, and Boris Johnson, who uh, was the Mayor of London at the time, and has obviously uh, gone on to bigger and better of things uh, since then, uh, the challenge to industry from government was we want somewhere where all of this comes together that can speak for all of this. And in drawing that together, um, it helps the industry to work with the regulators and work with government in offering global investors exactly the sort of thing that they're looking for uh, in all of those functions uh, being located in London and in the UK so that when they want to invest in the UK, when they want to invest in a business, uh, there is a, a pre-existing uh, 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 structure that they can plug into really easily, really quickly. It makes the whole process much less uh, uh, difficult, uh, much less painful. Uh, and that allows uh, us to be able to bring to bear all the different parts of the private sector part of the ecosystem to support the state part of the ecosystem and indeed vice versa uh, to encourage capital to come to a centre like the UK. Many thanks, Miles. Uh, this for me sounds like good news for, you know, emerging and aspiring players like Rwanda. You know, you need to work hard, uh, build the right, build up the right framework, and then, you know, it becomes uh, pull instead of push, right? So the international investors will come and then you just have to serve them well, right? So, but of course, this right uh, ingredients need to be in place first. And this, of course, we have seen in the case of Dubai takes time. Um, James, uh, let me come back to you. Um, you closely cooperate with uh, several Chinese entities in part of your business as at uh, Astana International Financial Center, for instance, for the exchange uh, AIX. Um, and furthermore, uh, Kazakhstan and Astana International Financial Centers are also well positioned along the Belt and Road or the Belt and Road Initiative of China. So a vast investment program. I guess this is a huge advantage, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, we, we are blessed sort of geographically. And I think I think what we've realized, obviously, with the with the positioning and the size that we have in Kazakhstan, I mean, it, it the opportunity that we have is has been highlighted, I would say, especially in some sectors, given what has happened with COVID. Obviously, with COVID, people have been realizing that they need to have near to mid shore logistics plans, for instance. And so it's not only with China that we have this highlighted, where we have, for instance, the largest dry port in the world, Korgos, is on the borders between China. But it's also, remember, that we have the longest 
contiguous border in the world between two countries, which is between obviously ourselves and Russia to the north. So it's not only that, it's the, it's the positioning. Yes, we have the, the Silk Road, the Belt and Road, but we also have the northern corridor from China across to Russia. We have the central corridor where we have built over 2,300 kilometers of railways to connect with the China. And then I, I would say also, especially with regards to agriculture. So as with our friends in the Middle East, we are diversifying away from a fossil and extraction-based GDP. That will take time. However, agriculture, I think, with regards to China, Russia, is very, very key for us, given that we are focusing so much together with the World Bank, with ADB and the like, on improving and, and, and benefiting from the agricultural sector. So we have China as a large uh, importer of food, absolutely. When it comes to financial, then, it's not only it's not only physical infrastructure, it's physical and digital infrastructure. So you hear people obviously talking about the digital Silk Road, or we're talking about a renewable energy network, very much to Jennifer's opening remarks about trying to greenwash our proper investments. So there are the, those opportunities there. Uh, and we have been designated by uh, Beijing as being the RMB center on uh, the Belt and Road. So it's very much about e-commerce as well, trying to, to create that sort of uh, middle landing ground, if you will, between the uh, different types of markets, given the, the sensitivities and the, and, the, and the geopolitical play that we have. But it's definitely much uh, an opportunity, but not just towards China, but also our, our, our other neighboring regions, including Europe and the Middle East. Uh, James, if I may, we have a question from our audience. Uh, do you do you partner with other international financial centers or countries uh, to attract and deploy international capital? I mean, very, very much so. I mean, we, we, we focus as not only with, uh, with yourselves uh, and our World Alliance of International Financial Centers, we work very, very closely with Miles in the City UK, for instance, leveraging off their experience, seeing how we can, for instance, um, improve our corporate governance. Uh, improve the, the international standards of doing business. And then it's very much, for instance, we work with the likes of, um, of Toronto and other markets with regards to mining, where we have similar overlaps as well. Um, I mean, we are doing very, very closely. We signed, for instance, a, an MOU uh, in St. Petersburg Forum recently, which I'm sure you're aware was very active forum. We signed there with the Moscow Financial Center an MOU with specific areas of collaboration. And I think that is very much in you know, areas, for instance, that we look to learn from each other, because although we may have nascent markets, we have new members such as Rwanda, we can still learn from them uh, because they're very much thinking differently. We have the benefits of the older members and benefits from the younger members. So it's very much about collaboration as well. Absolutely. Thanks a lot. Uh, to the um, Rwanda, James has just mentioned Rwanda. So let me ask Chinese investment. Is that also a factor in Rwanda? And you tr do you try to ac accommodate this at Rwanda Finance or with other uh, entities in Kigali? Thank you very much, Joran, for the question. And, uh, and again, it is always inspiring to be uh, surrounded by um, other financial centers uh, like uh, Dubai, UK, or or in Kazakhstan, uh, because as, as was said, we are all learning from each other. So in the case of, um, of China, uh, maybe before being specific to Chinese investors, um, I believe that all the panelists will agree with me that um, as international financial center, we want to address the needs of all investors uh, coming from China, coming from Europe, coming from North America, and really do our best uh, to accommodate them. Um, now, in the specific case of China, um, as you know, uh, I just mentioned that the needs of infrastructure investment on the continent is huge. We are talking about billions on a yearly basis. And we all know that Chinese investors are key in the development of infrastructure on the African continent. So yes, they are very important to us. You know, looking at... Um, uh, for example, the, the number of um, tax treaties that they have on the continent. Today, I think they have around 14 to 15 tax treaties uh, on the continent. And the role that we want to play there, and I will take 
some of the words coming from, from James, um, is to be the de-risking platform of Chinese investors on the continent by actually offering them the connectivity with our network of double tax treaties that we have with other African countries. Um, so we are looking at that. We are looking at where those, where those FDIs are going uh, from China to other African countries. And in our strategy to develop the, our DTA network, we take a priority on those big markets. That's one aspect of it. The second aspect, of course, is to also understand, um, and this one was already discussed before, that Chinese investors also have some, some preferences in terms of type of investment that are looking at being uh, in the range, I mean, being in the field of commodities, in the field of infrastructure, in the field of uh, certain strategic projects. Um, and again, here, what we want to make sure is for them to find uh, the right project directly in, in Rwanda. But I would like to, to go a little bit into the financial space. Um, because when you look at um, financial institutions from China, uh, today they are quite active in certain countries, um, in Europe and in Asia, but you will see very few Chinese banks operating on the continent. Um, and here it is really something that we would like to, why we would like to open, I will say, the, the debate is um, how to make it easier for their financial institutions to also operate in region or countries where they are doing business, because it is always important to be closer to your market. Um, so here, the effort that we are putting in place is also on the clarity, transparency of our policies for those Chinese banks to be able to easily assess the attractiveness of, of Rwanda in terms of domicile for their financial institution. So, um, so yes, we have made, and, and I'm happy that the comment came from, from Mike, um, if you look at the policy reforms, you know, Rwanda is one of the few countries on the continent where you can speak uh, French, English, you know, Rwanda, Swahili, and you can hear from my accent that I, I speak French uh, mostly. But um, uh, all the policy reforms that we have made are based on common law. And uh, we want investors that are coming here to be familiar with, with the different clauses or provision that we put. And for that, we have looked at other centers, um, starting with Dubai, start, uh, looking at UK, looking at other ones uh, that have been more mature in this journey of providing uh, financial services. So, so to go back to your question, yes, Chinese investors are very key to us. And being Rwanda Finance, being Rwanda Development Board, being the private sector federation, um, different institutions in the country are doing their best, <clears throat> sorry, to, to find the, the right approach uh, to present Rwanda as a competitive and attractive place to do business. Uh, but again, um, this is an easier journey when we are able to collaborate with other centers. So those that today, for example, um, are the regional hub for R&D investment are also in our target list, if I may say, um, in order to, to capture part of those investments that may also want to come into the continent. I hope I'll, I've not been too, too long in my answer, but, uh, but basically, yes, uh, we want to create the proximity between Chinese investors and African opportunities so they can find the right uh, platform and uh, uh, for, for us in Africa to, to be able to monetize those opportunities uh, through Kigali. Thank you. Thank you very much. This was definitely not too long, but we are curious to learn more what's happening in Kigali. Um, Ali, uh, we have heard already from, from James uh, and uh, their relationship uh, with Rwanda. You know, how is DFC doing? Uh, do you work uh, closely with Rwanda, or with other financial centers in, in Africa? And uh, do you have any advice for 2D? Should they also set up a free zone like you did before? Yeah, thanks, uh, Jochen. Uh, yeah, great question. I mean, we are, you know, as, as you've heard from James um, and, um, and Mars as well, I mean, we very much um, 
look to work and collaborate with other other centers so we we regularly have delegations from various African countries um, come and visit. Um, obviously, the IFC in Dubai, um, you know, is a successful uh, execution of a concept, and so people are very interested to to learn how it's been done. and And we're very open in terms of sharing you know, our experiences um, uh, at the same time, as well as having you know the formal MOUs and all the rest of it, but real practical engagement we're very happy to uh, to participate in that and you know really really from our side you know i think that you know actually you know 16 years at the difc i've never really thought um explicitly about um how do i you know how, how do i uh, attract investors um what you know the, the approach has been how do we attract and educate the market participants, um, and, and that's all the stakeholders that Miles mentioned. So, it's, you know, the lawyers, the accountants, the financial institutions, the financial firms, uh, and because you know, in a way, um, they're key conduits for FDI for foreign direct investment. Because not only are they FDI in of themselves, so if you have a financial institution, they set up an office, they bring people, blah blah blah. But they then have a self-interest in, in, in engaging investment opportunities to their underlying clients who happen to be investors, right? So, yeah, let's, you know, th that's the power of the financial center, the cluster. So in terms of your objectives, um, think about, you know, um, you know the, the, the market participants and, and they will bring uh, the investors um, to, to a degree. Uh, the, the other aspect is, um, you know, um, we're all new concepts, we're all, you know, you know new ideas, and um, it's not quite, um, you know, Malcolm X's quote about, uh, I didn't land on Plymouth Rock, but Plymouth Rock landed on me or us. Uh, we sort of uh, arrived within an existing ecosystem. So there's quite a lot of work to do um, in terms of weaving in the new model with what is already there uh, to bring, you know, consistency and also, you know, to a degree, overcoming existing interests and to educate and inform uh, and make aware that actually by doing this, you'll grow the pie for everyone involved. Um, so that there is a bit of legwork to do and it's, it's again gradual and incremental. It doesn't happen overnight. So you know, getting you know, for example, the different regulators on the same page does take some time. Um, but you know, stick with it, and uh, and I'm sure you know you'll be successful. Uh, thank you very much. And I heard a little bit there's a closer partnership between Dubai and Kigali in the making, which would be great. Uh, Miles, uh, of course, uh, you know. A uh, financial center like London or the Hall UK, it's not only providing capital for the UK, but uh, I think you can also help emerging uh, financial centers to attract more capital. So any any thoughts on this? Sure. And, and, and I think one of the great things that's come out from this panel is, is a recognition, uh, and I think a really powerful message, that this isn't a zero-sum game. If one international financial center does well, it doesn't mean another one does poorly, actually. It tends to mean that we all do better. It's a rising tide that lifts all boats. And for that reason, City UK has always seen itself as a, as a natural partner. We can help emerging international financial centers to understand the policies, the trends, the experience that we've gone through, that others have gone through. And I think the World Alliance is a great example of this in the way that there's a terrific sharing of information and best practice uh, and people can learn from each other's successes and each other's mistakes uh, and we see ourselves as part of uh, as part of that process so we work very closely with governmental authorities with regulators here in the UK and abroad particularly as new uh, innovative areas are emerging such as ESG uh, sustainability fintech which is a huge UK advantage um, and uh, we in the industry have done our bit to facilitate that sort of inward investment into the UK, uh, but also uh, overseas. And uh, James uh, very kindly talked about the important partnership that we've had with AIFC 
uh, down the years, obviously uh, kindly hosting this event. And we've helped them with attracting inward investment and helping our members secure uh, uh, international investment opportunities. So uh, there's an appetite uh, that exists uh, amongst companies. There's an appetite that exists amongst governments. And we see ourselves as natural partners uh, to bring people together, working alongside many of the people on this call, working alongside the World Alliance um, for something that ultimately benefits citizens uh, and benefits customers. Uh, thanks a lot, Miles. We only have 30 seconds left, uh, but James, you wanted to comment on, on Ali, maybe your closing words. No, no, what, I, what I'm saying is, thank you, Jochen. I mean, what, what I'd like to say is, it's obviously that the panel has interestingly shown that there's different levels of maturity. Very much in Dubai, there are the special economic zones pre-established. So what we have to do in other more emerging uh, regions, such as ourselves in Kigali, is what I like to say is we're not just a center for financial services. We are a center for raising finance. And that's very much a key message. So if, if in Rwanda or, or in Nur Sultan or even in, in Casablanca, you, you have to be able to show that you can raise money and capital and help the, the traditional sectors of perhaps industrials or, 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 or fintech and or the traditional uh, agriculture or something in tourism. So I think that's very much key for the, for the financial centers to realize it's not just around the professional services. Ali, we would all like to get there, but fortunately you're reaping the benefits. We, we look forward to joining you. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Yeah, let me close by thanking all of you, also Jennifer for her introduction, uh, for all your insights. There's a lot to talk more uh, on this topic, but I think our time is uh, over. So many, many thanks and uh, yeah, back to the conference. Thank you.